Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Pre-Calculus Foundational Skills Week 3, where myself, Brian McLogan, is getting you prepared for pre-calculus. So if you have missed the last two weeks, feel free to go back and check out those when you have time. But in today's lesson, I want to keep you focused on working on some more problems that are going to prepare you for pre-calculus, because I know, guys, like it or not, the school year is fast approaching. So just a couple reminders. Um, if you have not already downloaded the workbook, go ahead and go to brianmclogan.com PC Foundations. Um, there I have my summer packet that I give to my students for them to prepare for pre-calculus. So this is something for the last two sessions I have um, gone over problems to help prepare you because we all forget how to do certain problems, you know, especially over the summer and as well, especially how last year ended, um, how last year ended, you know, with distance learning and everything. So um, go through, there's a lot of problems to just to kind of refresh you on what it is we want you to know as you begin to um, start on pre-calculus. Um, also, I have the answers worked out for you so you can quickly check your work. But I'm doing these trainings to also just remind you of what it is you need to do and how to approach many of those problems. Um, also, just want to remind you guys that I am releasing my course online. So I am going back into the classroom on August 3rd. Um, in addition to for me going back into the classroom, which I'll still be making videos for, I am also going to be um, releasing my course online because that is something that I allowed my students um, or my students obviously have had access to that for the last two years and um, I wanted to open it up for you guys to have the ability to learn from me um, in a digital age as well. And then the last thing, just wanted to remind you guys, is next Monday will be my last um, training, or at least formal training, um, that is going over those foundational skills. But don't worry, um, I always have some extra goodies for you guys as we get working up into the um, up to into the school year. So definitely um, some things just want to let you guys know. So in this kind of live stream, what we're going to talk about is simplifying rational expressions, um, rationalizing the denominator, uh, evaluating using the unit circle, um, how to find the missing angles of a right triangle um, using trig, and then also parallel lines and a transversal. And again, guys, um, this is not a in-depth you know, training on each of these topics. That would take a very, very long time. But what I am doing is I'm covering a couple questions in each of these sections to help you prepare for the um, for the workbook, the summer assignment that I have for you guys to download. Because I feel like if you go through this training as well as do the problems that I have in that workbook, you are going to have a really solid foundation when the school year starts. And again, that is true for students that are taking pre-calculus, college algebra, algebra two, um, or even, you know, calculus. I'm not sure if I said calculus or college algebra um, either way. But, you know, obviously, I am teaching pre-calculus again this year, so that is the design of the course, but a lot of these math skills are fairly basic um, that they can definitely help you out. So just uh, I want to go through another pre-calculus tip, uh, number three, that a lot of students think of pre-calculus sometimes, they get confused and they're like, oh, it's, you know, it's going to be difficult. Um, and it is, it is a difficult course. It can be very um, difficult, especially some of the topics that we cover. But I always like to remind students that, you know, don't overthink it. Um, Pre-calculus is really just a, you know, a combination of algebra two, trigonometry, and then some calculus topics, you know, really some kind, kind of foundational stuff. So the algebra two, you know, a lot of times we'd expand on what you've already learned. And sometimes students, you know, forgot what they already learned. So that's why that becomes difficult. Um, trigonometry is obviously a new concept for many students. You know, we covered a little bit in like geometry, um, but obviously we get a much more advanced into the trig. But really when you just kind of break things down, um, you know, you can really fairly basic um, concepts with the trigonometry that we just expand upon. And the same thing with the calculus um, topics. You know, it's really just hitting little topics here and there that we further explore in calculus. So, you know, if you come into problems or issues of understanding in pre-calculus, just try to slow down. Try to really understand where it is that you're having trouble. A lot of times it comes into just prior knowledge or thinking that the concept that you're trying to learn is really just more complicated than it is. Um, so really try to um, don't overthink it and try to slow things down and break it down. All right, so the goal really for um, this one, this uh, live stream is really to kind of build up that understanding of trigonometry, what it is you should know, um, as well as understanding angles and the angle relationships. And we're gonna do that with parallel lines as well as with triangles. So I cover a couple more because there is some problems with rational expressions. So that's why we're gonna kind of start with that first. So obviously this is a very heavy algebra two topic. 
um, is the rational expressions, but it is something that we do in pre-calculus. And it's one of those topics that students really struggle with. So that's why I just want to kind of cover these two problems. Um, we have already covered some factoring um, in my previous tr uh, week one, as well as in week two training. So if you are weak on factoring, I would highly recommend um, that you go back and check those trainings out. So whenever we're simplifying a rational expression, if it doesn't have any restrictions on that, then uh, we just want to make sure we understand that we cannot divide by zero. So we always want to find the values um, that are going to make the denominator equal to zero because those are going to be undefined values. Okay, those are what we call like our restricted values as well. So it kind of depends on the examples. In this case, we're just going to simplify it, but I will kind of remind you of what are the what are the uh, restricted values, meaning what are the values x cannot be. So first thing, whenever we see a rational expression is think of factoring, right? And you can think of factoring in a couple terms. Whenever you have a binomial, you would always kind of think of either difference of two squares or factoring out the GCF. All right, those are, and you could also do difference of two cubes, but um, we, that's not something I highlight as much, um, at least of course we do cover it, but not a very big um, topic. Or at least it's not something as common as you will see as far as GCF and difference of two squares. So immediately in this um, numerator, I noticed that I can factor out a three and a x squared. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do first here. I'm just gonna factor out a three x squared. When doing that, I'm gonna be left with a x, hmm, I don't think I wanted that, an x minus one. All right, um, so therefore I have a three x minus one. I think I just wanted an x. Oh, you know what? Ah, well, all right, well, let's just do it this way. Um, so then in the denominator, you can see that they all share a x squared as well. So if I factor out an x squared, that will be leaving me with a x squared minus a 2x plus 1. Okay? Um, so now, again, before we go ahead and simplify everything out, you know, and everything go crazy, like let's see if we can further factor this down. We recognize this to be a, um, a trinomial, a perfect square trinomial. So I can further factor that down into 3x squared times x minus 1 all over x squared times x minus one quantity squared, okay? Now, when we're really thinking of this quantity squared, that's really the same thing as x minus one times x minus one, okay? So this is important because here we can apply the division property. So what the division property tells us is whenever we have a number, a term, or an expression divided by itself, separated by multiplication, we can divide them to one, right? x squared divided by x squared is just one, right? We can say cancel out. It's not really a great mathematical term, but it's, you know, a lot of things that's something that sticks. But you can see we can cancel those out because the x squared is separated by its terms with multiplications. And the same thing goes for x minus one. The x minus ones, those divide out, right? Even though there's a minus, but that's inside of the expression. So we can still divide those out and therefore we're just going to be left with the expression of three over x minus one. Now there's nothing further we can do here that is gonna be fully simplified, but we do wanna go ahead and list the values that made our denominator equal to zero. And typically this is best understood or you know viewed when we have our expression fully simplified or at least fully factored out. And just kind of going back to there, you can see that, well, when x is equal to zero, then that makes my whole denominator equal to zero. So I don't want x to be zero, as well as when x is equal to one, that's gonna make my denominator equal to zero, right? Because if x was one, that'd be zero, and zero times anything is going to be zero. So I'm just gonna add in these restrictions, x cannot equal zero, and x cannot equal positive one. All right, um, so now getting into the next example. Um, now we see that we have something to the fourth power, but I can't factor this out, right? I can't factor out an x to the fourth. So this one kind of gets students um, pretty confused when we deal with this in polynomials. So what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm just gonna say, you know what, forget about the x to the fourth. What if this was just like a normal quadratic trinomial? Like what if it just looked like this? How could I factor that out, all right? So again, this is like a little sidebar. And if I wanted to factor that out, I could say, well, that's gonna be x minus two times x minus one, right? Because we kind of practiced our factoring in the last two trainings. So. If you recognize this, that, well, we know a trinomial is gonna be a product of two factors. So we know that this is going to be the two factors, x minus two times x minus one. The problem comes in is x times x does not give you x to the fourth, it gives you x squared. So all I need to do is just raise the powers, right? Because x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. I still need negative two times negative one to give me positive two. So it still works. And if you do the middle terms, they're gonna to add to give you a negative three x squared. Now in my denominator, I have another binomial, so, but I recognize they have a 
um, an x in common, so I'm gonna factor out the x, and that's gonna leave me with a x squared minus one. And again, in this case, you can see that those are going to divide out. So that's just gonna leave me with a x squared minus two divided by x. Now, here's something that happens that's important, is the x squared minus one, that got divided out, but that doesn't mean those values are still, um, are now going to be defined, right? So whenever you're identifying the restricted values, you have to go back to the original equation because what I wanna do is I wanna say, what numbers are gonna make this e the denominator equal to zero? Well, obviously when x equals zero, the denominator is gonna equal zero, right? So we say x cannot equal zero. Well, what else? Well, we have this expression. So if I can just say x squared minus one equals zero, you could go ahead and solve and say x equals plus or minus one. Right? And again, that works because if you plug in one as well as negative one into this equation, you're going to get zero. So I'll just say x cannot equal plus or minus one. So even though it got divided out, just like it happened over here, make sure that you still understand that those are still going to be restricted values. And that was also something we talked about. Remember, those are holes. We talked about that in our discontinuities last lesson. All right, uh, moving on to rationalizing the denominator. So this is one that's um, you know kind of interesting because it technically we don't always have to rationalize the denominator. In some chapters and in some problems we want to, and it's going to be very helpful. Um, obviously, we start to do this with different applications, such in like trigonometric identities. So this understanding of the rationalizing the denominator is very important. So we've done them previously, if you remember in algebra two, with. Uh, you know, complex numbers and everything like that. But really the idea is not so much, you know, yes, you could think about it in terms of like simplifying, but in really I just want you to understand what is this goal? What is happening when we rationalize the denominator? So real quick, I'm just gonna go through, if we have a, you know, an expression like x plus two, if I multiply it by, a, or I'm sorry, x plus two, a plus b, and I multiply by a minus b, what that gives me is the difference of two squares, a squared minus b squared. Now this is very important for a couple of reasons. If I'm squaring these denominators, if I'm squaring the square root, what that's gonna do is that's gonna undo the square root. So if we wanna have an expression where we do not have a square root in the denominator, that's why rational, that's why rational line denominator is so helpful. In terms of complex numbers, like when we don't want i to be in the denominator, well, i squared, right, if you remember, is going to be uh, negative one. So when we rationalize the denominator with i, that gets rid of the i in the denominator. And the same thing with the trigonometric functions. Um, we want our trigonometric functions to be squared. That opens up different identities for us. So the main thing that we were gonna wanna do when we want to rationalize the denominator is you gotta be careful. We don't wanna multiply by the square root of six because if you multiply by the square root of six on the top and the bottom, right? Well, that gives you the square root of six minus six. So it's still gonna give you a radical in the denominator. So what I want to do in this case is multiply what we call the conjugate. So that is going to be one plus the square root of six. Okay, now again, this produces the difference of two squares. So I'm gonna put this in parentheses. But again, the difference of two squares, we don't need to multiply everything times everything. We can just take the first two terms squared. One times one is one squared. So let's just say on the numerator, I have square root of two times one plus square root of six. Okay, so one times one is one, and then negative square root of six times negative square root of six is going to be a negative six, all right? Now we can distribute here. So square root of two times one is going to be a square root of two. Square root of two times square root of six, remember when we're multiplying radicals, we're gonna multiply the radicands together, so that's two times six, which is going to be 12, and this is going to be a negative five. All right, now, again, we could further simplify the square root of 12 Right? The square root of 12 can be broken down into four times three, which is two, radical three. All right, And then there's just really kind of comes into many, many different ways of rewriting this. You could put the, you know, uh, let's put, you could put the one fifth in front. Um, you could just rewrite this as square root of two plus two, radical three over negative five. So let's just write it like that. Um, you know, another way, just real quick, I'm not gonna do it for the other one, but you could also write it like this. I mean, it really kind of depends on how your teacher, professor, textbook, you know, wants the answer. But, um, but yeah, so that's basically, you can see the nice thing about this is that we just don't have a rational expression with the um, radical in the denominator. So in this case, we're just going to do the exact same thing where we recognize the conjugate. So it's going to be one plus the square root of six 
So one plus the square root of six. The only difference here is now I have a binomial in my numerator, which is not um, the conjugate. So I'm actually gonna need to expand that out. I'm gonna actually need to multiply everything times everything, do a little FOIL practice. So let's go ahead and do that in the numerator. So that'd be, let's see, one plus the square root of six plus the square root of two. And then that's gonna be plus um, square root of 12. My denominator, this is exactly the same. So I'm just gonna rewrite that as a negative five. And then up here, it's just gonna be combining like terms. Well, again, remember, we can only combine like terms if they have the same radicand. Well, I can simplify this, right, to two square root of three. And so we have one plus the square root of six plus the square root of two plus two square root of three all over negative five. And you might say that does not look any more simplified than that problem. And I would have to agree to you. But again, the idea is just to understand this um, rationalizing the denominator um, because we will be using it in a couple different applications uh, throughout the course. All right, so the next one is the unit circle. Now, when I used to teach algebra two, um, we used to not cover trigonometry at all. And trigonometry has kind of, you know, got itself, uh, wedged itself into the Algebra 2 curriculum, uh, which is a whole nother video on its own. But most students that I have encountered in pre-calculus have at least a basic understanding of the unit circle. I am not a big proponent of memorizing the unit circle by any means. Um, we do a lot of practice on the unit circle in my class. And I explain the unit circle. And we spend a lot of time understanding the unit circle and being able to evaluate using the unit circle. So what I'm going to do for this video is I'm just going to assume that students have at least been presented to the unit circle and at least understand the, um, or at least know the first couple points in this first quadrant, okay? Because I think all the points that I picked, yeah, are relative to the first couple quadrants here. And I'm not gonna go crazy with my explanations here because I spend so much more time um, in pre-calculus explaining and having students understand these points. Because I think it's really important um, that students understand where these points come from. Um, so therefore, when they're using them, they can understand you know, if their um, points and everything make sense or not. Uh, it's the square root of three. Oh, you're gonna do it to me, okay. All right, so again, this is a you know, I don't need, let's put this right there. Let me move this right. Hmm, I ran out of room. Let's go right there. Yeah, I don't need a lot of room. Okay, I'll put that right there. Perfect. And then let's put a three here. Okay, so again, this is just the first quadrant of the unit circle. And remember, the unit circle has a radius of one. Um, these are going to be three angles. That is uh, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 60 degrees, also known as pi over six, pi over, pi over four, and pi over three. So um, we're gonna wanna make sure we understand the difference between radians and degrees. And again, we spend a lot of time um, with that. I think actually in... Either way, I think actually, I might actually change this. I'm not sure, I don't remember if I covered radians uh, with my students, but maybe I did in algebra too, I'm trying to think. But either way, um, I'll write the, the degree formula as well for each of those. So anyways, if I wanna evaluate the sine of 30 degrees, most students come into pre-calculus maybe having memorized that the sine represents the y coordinate on the unit circle. And you know, somewhat that is true. So. If we go to 30 degrees, that's gonna be the smaller of the three angles, and then one, the y coordinate is just gonna be one half, okay? So again, remember the sine is the comparison of the opposite side of a triangle over the hypotenuse, right? But we can also think about it as this y coordinate um, on a point on the unit circle. And again, I'll make that connection throughout the course, but I think it's just important for students to understand these two kind of um, areas here, because really, actually, let me just do a quick little thing. That is the height, and remember the hypotenuse is one. So one half over one, you can see is one half. So opposite, right, that's the height, opposite over um, hypotenuse. All right, the next one is cosine of negative 45 degrees. So 45 degrees is right here. So cosine would be like one half, right? So negative 45 degrees is just gonna be in the opposite direction. So that's gonna be going down here. Well, if you think about this as just a reflection, if this is over, Square root, of two, square root of two over two. Well, this, you can see that this is gonna be the exact same, right? If you go 45 degrees up or if you go 45 degrees down, the X coordinate is still gonna be exactly the same. So that's going to be the square root of two over two. 
The reason why the unit circle is so powerful is because we cannot use triangles to evaluate for the tangent of 90 degrees. That just doesn't make any sense um, to us when we're looking at a triangle. However, um, if we look at this coordinate point here at 90 degrees, that is going to be 0, 1. Because again, remember the radius of this circle is 1. So tangent represents the opposite over the hypotenuse, right? If you were thinking about this opposite over hypotenuse, that would be the same thing as the y over the x. So in this case, if we have y over x for a tangent, you can see that that is undefined. Now that's not always the case, because we could also look at the tangent of 0, and that would be um, 0 over 1, which would be 0. So just don't think that because tangent is on a um, an axis that is going to be undefined. It's Remember, it's just always y over x. But whenever you're dividing by 0, that is going to give you an undefined value. For the next one, d, that's going to be 2 pi over 3. So if we said, and again, 2 pi over 3 is the same thing as 120 degrees. So let's just kind of think about this in terms of degrees. I don't know why I wanted to introduce radians here. I just want to keep it simple. But either way, that's way it started. So let's just kind of look at 60 degrees. So from here to here is 60 degrees. Right? And therefore, we know that it, another 60 degrees is going to take you to 120. Right? So if you were to kind of like finish this circle, you can see that that is just a reflection. So the sine is, remember, representing the y coordinate. So if we have the sine here of sine of, um, sine of uh, 2 pi over 3, that's going to be square root of 3 over 2. And again, as I reflect this over, right, here's 60 square root of 3 over 2. Over here, the only thing that's going to be negative is the negative is the x-coordinate, right? Because as we go to the left of the y-axis, the x-coordinate is negative, but the y-coordinate is still positive. So therefore, this is just going to be a square root of 3 over 2. Um, then let's go ahead and take a look at... Da -da -da -da. I could have done 150, that would have been. But let me just kind of, real quick, what if I would have done cosine of 150 degrees? So here's 30 degrees, right? And if you were to kind of rotate this, like 30 degrees off of the x-axis. So here's 30 degrees off the x-axis, zero, so that's 30 degrees. And if I did 30 degrees off the x-axis over here, like halfway around the circle is 180, so you can see that would be 150. The important thing I wanted you to see here is this is going to be a negative square root of 3 over 2, right? Because when you go to the second quadrant, you can see that the x coordinates are all negative. Anything down below here, like for instance, if I did the, what, the sine of negative pi over 4, that would be a negative square root of 2 over 2, right? Because look at this point down here. That's in the third or in the fourth quadrant, I'm sorry. So the sine, the y coordinate, is negative. So I could have done a little bit more problems, I guess, um, to kind of further drive home the points. Um, cosine of 0 in this case, 0 degrees is right there. Um, so their cosine represents the x coordinate, which is just 1. And again, it's very difficult to think about or to conceptualize what is cosine representing. You know, when it's zero degrees, that's not going to make up a triangle. So by looking at the unit circle, we can see how that makes sense. And then not but not but last least, not but last not not but last least, I don't know, I can't even talk anymore. Um, that's gonna be tangent of 60 degrees. These ones always get students because again, tangent is y over x, right? So if we have 60 degrees here, that's gonna be the y coordinate, square root of three over two, all over one half. So now we have a fraction divided by a fraction. Well, whew, what we need to do is, again, multiply by the reciprocal, right? Because in the previous trainings, we practiced this multiplying fractions. That goes to 1, and therefore those divide out, and we're just left with the square root of 3. So even though it looked like a very confusing problem, we can simplify it very, um, very smoothly. So that is just a brief little overview of these main points that are on the unit circle, as well as what happens when we take these points or we take these angles out of the first quadrant and we start discussing them on the axes, as well as in the second, the fourth, and the third quadrant. And I didn't do a problem in the third quadrant, but just remember in the third quadrant, the x and the y values are both negative. All right, so now let's go and do some missing sides and angles because once we start talking about the unit circle, students completely forget about the meaning of our trigonometric functions. Like they just remember sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x, and they completely forgot that they're still triangles, right? And I, that's why I kind of made that mention up here is like this is a triangle. Like that's what the unit circle is made of. It's made of special right triangles. So the unit circle is just a tool for us to um, more easily evaluate our trigonometric functions. Now, I decided to not use angles that were 
um, not on the unit circle because again, if you didn't have angles that were on the unit circle, you just use a calculator. So the main thing I want to do is just remind you that to use your trigonometric functions, you have to have right angles. And also what you need to do is you have to have right angles and, um, what else do you need? Oh, you need to set up an equation. Okay. So in this case, um, and previous training, we just kind of talked about using, uh, what the Pythagorean theorem and just setting up the ratios. So hopefully now you have a little bit of idea of the, or you remember what the ratios were. So now let's actually put them into action. Okay, so in this case, I have an angle and I have the opposite side and the hypotenuse, right? Because remember the, op the hypotenuse is always directly across from the 90 degree angle and the opposite side is always opposite of the angle, okay? So we have a opposite and a, um, opposite and, oh geez, we have the opposite side and the hypotenuse. So we need to think about which trigonometric function represents the opposite and the hypotenuse, and that is sine. So I can say the sine of 30 degrees equals the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So if I wanna solve for x, all I need to do is get four off, I just need to solve for x. So I'm just gonna multiply by four on both sides. I'm just gonna rearrange this here. So x equals, oops, the four times the sine of 30 degrees. Now, this is where kind of knowing your trig is helpful, right? Kind of going back up here, what is the sine of 30 degrees? Well, sine 30 degrees is right here. The sine is represented by one half. So now I can just say, oh, okay. So sine of 30 degrees, that's four times one half. You don't need to use a calculator, right? Well, at least here, because we have a point on the unit circle. If it wasn't on the unit circle, then you'd obviously need to use a unit, uh, use a calculator. But you can see how useful this is, and, you know, especially for you to know these points on the inner circle. Like you can, oh, sine of 30 degrees, that's one half, and then you can go and evaluate. Um, that was supposed to be there. Sorry, I messed that one up. All right. For the next example, um, now we have the, we don't have the opposite side anymore. We still have the hypotenuse, but we have the side that's between the angle and the 90 degree. That is what we call our adjacent side. So in this case, I'm going to need to use cosine. So I say cosine of 45 degrees is equal to my adjacent over my hypotenuse. Now the problem here is we have our variable x is in the denominator. So I need to do a couple different steps. I need to multiply by x on first on both sides to get the x off the denominator. And then I need to divide by cosine of 45 degrees. Okay, so x equals two divided by the cosine of 45 degrees. All right, again, let's go and look at our unit circle. Cosine of 45 degrees was that middle angle. That's going to be square root of two over two. So this is going to be two divided by square root of two over two. Well, crap, I have a fraction in the denominator. I do not want a fraction in the denominator, right? So what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal. Okay, that means those are going to divide out. That divides to one, those divide out to one. That leaves me with one over the square root of two, which now I can rationalize. I don't need to multiply by a conjugate because there's no addition or subtraction, but I can rationalize the denominator here by multiplying by the square root of two to get it off the denominator, which is square root of two over two. There you go. All right. And the last example, where's my thing? Oh, there it had. Uh, my last example is going to be, what am I doing? Why did I do from there? Hmm. I didn't want to do that. Oh, okay. Um, no, let's do, sorry. That needs to be, I'm messing all this stuff up. Uh-oh. Oh, I got this. Let's do that. Hmm. No, that's not gonna work. That's not what I was thinking of. Okay. Um, crap. I moved this around and now I'm trying to think, well, I guess I'll just do this one. Um, hold on, let me check this out. Sorry guys for the delay. Um, something is not right. Okay, um, that's square root of two over two divided by x. I made a mistake here. That's multiplied by x on both sides, divide by that. So that's gonna be square root of two over two. Oh, I'm sorry, that's gonna be four. No wonder, I was wondering where my mistake was. So I said those divide out, those don't divide out. That's in the numerator. I was wondering what happened here. So that is a four times square root of two. 
Those divide out. That gives you a two, square root of two. There you go. I wonder something was wrong because remember the hypotenuse is always the larger side. So you got to think those do not divide out. That was a big mistake there. Okay. Just be careful because it looked like it was in the denominator. So my brain like went that way. But again, that's in the numerator. Like that is like really two over one. So sorry about that. All right. In my uh, last example here, um, again, now we're going to have the same thing. We're going to use be using cosine, but now we don't know what the angle is. So again, we're still going to set up our ratio. So cosine of x equals three over six. Okay. Well, cosine of x equals one half. Now, in this case, um, what we want to do is be able to find the angle. So we want to say cosine of what angle equals one half. Now, without getting into our restrictions and everything like that, let's just kind of look at, we know that the angles in a triangle have to fall between zero and 90 degrees, right? So by looking at our angle in our triangle, we say, all right, which of these angles um, matches when the X coordinate is one half? And you can see it's that angle right there, which is 60 degrees. So we can just say X equals 60 degrees. So again, you could also rewrite that in your calculator, x equals, if you remember, that's the inverse function, cosine inverse of one half, which again would be 60 degrees or pi over three if we were kind of talking about radians and so on and so forth. So just a quick little review. Remember when we're using our trigonometric functions, we're finding the sides of the um, angle and we're going to use our inverse trigonometric functions when we want to find the actual angles of a triangle. All right, and then um, last real training that I wanted to cover with you guys was just understanding the parallel lines and the transversal. You don't need to remember um, all the, all the, you don't always have to have parallel lines and a transversal, but um, because again, there's a couple things you should remember. In this first example, we can see that these are what we call vertical angles. And remember, vertical angles are what we call congruent. So X is equal to 30 degrees, right? So when you have two intersecting lines and you have angles on opposing sides of the intersection, um, then those two angles are going to be congruent. Here we have what we call a linear pair. We have two angles um, that are supplementary. They're going to add up to 180 degrees because you can see they have the shared side and they make up a line. So we can say X plus 80 degrees is equal to 180 degrees. They are supplementary. They add up to a line. So therefore, we can say X equals 100 degrees. Now, I didn't need parallel lines and a transversal. I was going to do more of the, you know, what you need to know for parallel lines and transversal. But really, I think there's kind of two of them you know. These come up a lot. This comes up a lot. So it's kind of important for you to remember those. The other two that come up is alternate interior angles or alternate um exterior angles. And we should note that you have to have parallel lines for you to have um, either of those properties or to use those um, theorems. So the alternate interior angle say, says that when you have parallel lines and a transversal, then that these two angles, these alternate interior angles, they're both interior of the parallel lines, but they alternate on sides of the transversal are going to be congruent. So X is going to equal 75 degrees. That is also the same thing for alternating exterior angles. So that works as well. Um, and then the last one is going to be also that our other angles that are congruent is what we call corresponding angles. So corresponding angles are angles that are on the same side of the transversal, right? And kind of like both above or both below your parallel lines. So you can see how they're kind of like in the same position here. And these are going to be um, equal as well. So that is something that just kind of comes up, especially when we do our applications of trigonometry um, units. We kind of go back into trigonometry and a lot of students like, to or geometry, I'm sorry, and a lot of students have forgot those angle relationships um, as well as the you know triangles and the angles and the sides of a triangle. So that's why, you know, it's a, it's, Fairly simple stuff, but it's some stuff that, you know, I think it's very helpful for you to just kind of have a brief little refresher on. All right, so just a little review. What we covered from this training, guys, was we simplified rational expressions. We practiced rationalizing the denominator. Um, we practiced evaluating the unit circle, uh, finding the missing sides and angles of a triangle, and then as well as doing... Um, finding missing measures using parallel lines and a transversal. So what is up next? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have one more formal training to go um, for pre-calculus. That will be happening next week. So please make sure you guys um, go ahead and download the workbook if you have not already, or if this is your first training, go back to the other two trainings um, and just make sure that you have a good understanding of 
what I covered. Um, Because therefore, as you move through the end of these four weeks, um, I feel that you are going to have a solid foundation uh, ready for pre-calculus. And of course, that is obviously going to be supported by the workbook. Again, this is the exact same workbook that I give my students to prepare for pre-calculus. And this is something that I have been revising for the past couple years. You know, I gave it to them, changed out some questions, improved it. And um, I know it's something that has benefited students that either struggled with math, you know, came in from other schools and they, you know, maybe... We're not sure what they um, were, what they needed to know, and then also students that thought they were really strong in math, or you know, got A's in algebra too, um, and then they noticed that oh, there's some things that you covered in this workbook that I really, really needed. So um, again, I have all the answers for you guys, and then I will be um, doing one more training next week, as well as sharing you guys with an extra bonus coming up. So otherwise, guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you guys on the next training. All right, cheers.